Hello and welcome to this last video on colloids where we'll be discussing in which sense colloidal particles can be uh, understood as being artificial atoms. So the first question we'll ask is basically in which sense are they like atoms, colloidal particles I mean. The, the first reason that comes to mind is basically that they satisfy the colloidal scale. And we have seen that the colloidal scale indeed correspond to the size of a particles uh, of particles such that the um, they do not sediment when they are put in a fluid at least on earth and also they do not enter or the, the, the quantum regime is basically of no importance for their behavior and therefore they correspond to uh, almost like perfect um, um, classical models um, of atomic fluids, okay? So where you imagine beads that are like running around and, and where the motion is basically controlled and governed by classical mechanics. It turns out that the uh, interpreting colloids as being classical models of atomic fluids has been tremendously important and useful to improve our understanding of the basic phases of matter. Now, I won't enter into the details of this particular discussion here uh, because it will go much beyond the scope of this particular course. However, this is something you, you need to just uh, have in a, in a corner of your head. Now, how do we actually improve our understanding of the basic phases of matter uh, with colloids? Well, basically, we can tune the interaction between them, okay, and that's the artificial aspect about these uh, colloids is that we can tweak the their the way they interact. So we have seen a little bit that there there are DLVO based modifications, okay, and the first one that we have mentioned uh, in the last video was that we can change, for example, the salt concentration, okay. So if I start this movie. So here this is the Dubai Huckel uh, pair of potential between two charged colloids um, and then as a function of distance and you see that uh, I plotted here the um, Coulomb potential as reference and the plane line in red is the Dubai Huckel potential. And we'll see what happens when we decrease the um, um, when we decrease the uh, screening length from 60 to 0. Right, so what you see is that there is a sharp decrease, okay, so it changes not only the range of the interaction, but of course uh, as well the magnitude of it, because everything is, is screened from uh, the outset, and therefore the magnitude of the electrostatic repulsion changes drastically. Okay, so this of course enables to change many things from the range to the magnitude of the electrostatic repulsion between two identical colloids. Now, um, one thing that I have not mentioned, which is still part of the DLVO uh, description, is basically that we can also modify the dielectric permittivity of the surrounding solution. So, uh, uh, we have seen that the Hamaker constant, in fact, due to the corrections by uh, Lifshitz, was of the order of epsilon 1 minus epsilon m divided by epsilon 1 plus epsilon m and then squared. So that's when the two interacting particles are this, made of the same stuff. And they interact across a medium m. And of course you can play around uh, by modifying the dielectric permittivity of this uh, medium m. And here this is what is plotted, okay, that it first decreases, okay, as you increase epsilon m from zero, and then it reaches a minimum which is exactly at zero and then it can increase again. So importantly, some, some people uh, want to sometimes decrease entirely the uh, Van der Waals interaction to zero, and the way to do it is basically to set it so that it's equal to the dielectric permittivity of the interacting colloids, and then this disappears entirely. Okay, so this method is called uh, index matching. Uh, technique, but of course, as I as I show here, there are many ways to be anywhere in between zero and one. 
So this is basically two methods that are based on DLVO. Now I want to focus a little bit more on two other like more like detailed two other methods okay that do not involve necessarily DLVO but which are used very commonly um, and traditionally also have been used throughout hist history. So first of all let's talk about grafting polymers on colloids. Okay, so this is a very standard technique that is used since ancient China where basically you take your colloids like this and maybe they would attract each other due to van der Waals and would be in an uh, unstable uh, colloidal suspension. Now what people do is basically they chemically graft uh, polymers on the surface of these colloids. And if we remember that these polymers are actually also moving about because of thermal fluctuations like this for example then overall what will be happening is that we can replace these grafted polymers by essentially some kind of soft core soft repulsive core by the way uh, of polymers that are like moving about okay it's just uh, graphically uh, more uh, like easier at least to see it and we can play the same game that we have played uh, before and try to see when this soft core will actually overlap what will be the repulsion that's it, the, the repulsion and interaction that will come from it. Uh, it turns out that here this is the actual uh, interaction. On purpose I don't put the equation because that's not my goal it's just to explain the technique and how it works. So basically you would have here U polymer which is the interaction due to the soft core uh, made of these polymers when when they uh, in, when they overlap, then you've got the van der Waals interaction between let's say the uh, colloidal uh, cores, and then you have the sum of the two, which is in black. And admittedly, here there is not even electrostatics. So what you see is that if there is no polymer, you would be in a situation where everything will be super unstable. They would just like aggregate like crazy. And now if you put polymers Basically, you've got this um, maximum that which is about 2.2 kT and then decreases uh, at close range. Now, if you take the two particles as we used to do in the last video, then when the uh, right particle is given a kick, then it will go like this. And then when it reaches about 1.5 kT, etc., it can't really go uh, further or at least it's very, very unlikely. And then it will be pushed back. Uh, to where it was. So this creates a new type of stability of colloidal suspension which is called steric stabilization and it is very very much used as well in industrial processes and so on and so forth. Now there is another technique that can be used and instead of uh, adding a, um, repulsion the goal here is to add attraction. So let's, so, and, so let's talk about this technique, so it's called the addition of depletants. So what are depletants? Well, you imagine you've got these uh, two colloids here, uh, they are represented slightly bigger, but you can imagine, of course, that they have the same size as before, just for the purpose of illustration. And then you put these guys in a sea of so-called depletants, which are uh, smaller particles, okay, in principle they should have exactly like I've drawn here at least about a fifth of the size of the colloidal particles and then you say okay fair enough there are these depletants around and they, are, they would be also moving due to thermal fluctuations so these are just smaller particles but then if you try to consider what happens when you get the colloids closer and closer to each other then you will reach a case where the distance between the centers of the two colloids is smaller okay, than twice the, um, the radius of the particles plus the radius of the depletants. And when this happens, it means that some depletants cannot go anymore into some region in between the two colloids. Okay? So there is some excluded region here, so the, the one that is drawn in red, where basically there is not a single part of a purple particle that can go in there. And now, because of the existence of this excluded region for depletants, there would be a difference between the inward pressure 
uh, created by the uh, depletants uh, that are outside of the um, of the colloids that are pushing them together, and the outward pressure that is due to the depletants that are that can still be in between the two uh, colloids, and this leads to a situation very close to what happens when you've got a tank that you empty entirely of any molecule in it, and then that is being crushed, like basically uh, in this clip, due to the outward, uh, due to the inward atmospheric pressure. And so here it happens exactly the same thing, but at a level that is of course uh, more colloidal, um, and so it's a bit smaller and of course a bit less dramatic. But basically it leads to something called the attractive depletion interaction, okay? Simply due to a difference in net pressure between inward pressure and outward pressure. So, more quantitatively, it's possible to show how that goes. Uh, the curve looks like this when the, depletion, when the depletion, depletion concentration is about 0.5. But of course, you imagine that if there is zero uh, concentration uh, in depletion, then there won't be any effect at all. So, somehow, the, the, the interaction has to depend on the concentration and that makes sense. If you remember the example we have seen with the container, of course that's because the atmospheric pressure is actually huge and that's because there are loads of air molecules outside uh, of the container. And so here the same thing goes and so what I will show is just a short clip of how the interaction changes when I vary the concentration from 0.5 to about 20. Um, and so we see that the uh, depth of the attractive well uh, increases about um, until about uh, 0.8, at least in depth, uh, kT. And most of the time it's about 1 kT in depth. And one crucial difference, and the reason why we would like to have this type of interaction rather than van der Waals, is that the van der Waals interaction is actually... Uh, as a well, a depth well, a well depth theory, which is infinite, okay, at least in theory. And so in practice, it goes to about tens of kBTs, and this has the uh, non wanted effect that this creates uh, a disordered aggregate, basically. If you want something that is a bit more um, uh, tractable and that, that is more controllable, in terms of attractive design, then this type of depletion interaction is good because you, you can tweak the actual uh, well uh, depth of the well to about few kts at maximum and also it's very short range. And so this gives rise to uh, many nice uh, designs uh, in, in colloidal science. Now I would just finish with the uh, uh, basically a list a non-exhaustive list because it's not really possible to be exhaustive but quick mention of some other modification that I can't discuss because I believe they would go beyond the scope of these particular uh, short lectures on, on colloids. So the first change is a change of pH. So this is something that is commonly done. Uh, you change the pH and this affects the charge on the surface of the colloidal particles. Of course in turn this affects the actual repulsion between two identical colloids. Another possible modification is to add chemically interacting patches on the, uh, on the surface of the colloids. So then you will have that if two patches are facing each other uh, on two different colloids, then let's say they attract, and if a patch is facing uh, a non-patch uh, region, uh, of a colloid, then nothing will happen, for example, or they don't attract, or they repel, or something. So you can have, like this, anisotropic interactions between two colloids, which, again, is used um, a lot in the current research and design uh, in, in colloidal science. Another one that has been used for about a decade or so, but is still under study and, and heavy research, has to do with grafting of DNA strands on the surface of colloids. This enables to have not only a repulsion, because DNA is kind of a polymer-like molecule, so there is some repulsion going on, but also it, it creates some binding selectivity between, let's say, colloids which would have different types of DNA grafted on them. And so people have been using that 
uh, both uh, theoretically and also in, in real life, in real applications to design materials, new types of materials that, let's say, that are smart materials that behave in some smart way to temperature changes and so on. And finally, something that has been, that has been done uh, in latest year is simply to modify the shapes uh, of the colloids. And this gives rise as well to anisotropic interactions and people have been designing uh, some, uh, some new fancy uh, structures uh, due to, thanks to these uh, new interactions. Of course, the list could go, uh, go uh, on and on and on and, and, and basically it's just because the, color, the field of colloidal science is just huge. So if people are interested in more on this, uh, I just recommend to look at our, uh, our website, there are also uh, specific journals which some of them have uh, papers that, that can be read for free uh, on, on this topic because this is too huge to, to cover it all in a single video. Um, I just want to close this set of lectures by saying that, oh, if you can actually change and tweak at will the interactions between the colloids, um, and on top of that, colloids behave as classical atoms, then basically there are also atoms or artificial atoms in the purest sense of the words uh, of the words of atoms or the meaning of atoms, which is that of self-assembling building blocks of materials that are around us. Um, and so indeed, in the latest years, or in the most recent years, people have been able to design colloidal molecules, for example, uh, with, let's say, two colloids, three colloids, five colloids, etc. So they can change the valency of the bonds between these colloids at will. And that's due as well to this one example is these patchy type co colloids. They have been also able to uh, create macro molecules of colloids, if you will, that are bio-inspired. So you see here uh, on the on in A you've got DNA-inspired uh, structure. Then on the in B you see a triple helix uh, structure that exists in fact uh, with DNA as well. Then you see something in C that is in inspired by uh, proteins. Okay, so you see these beta sheets uh, that, that are very standard in protein design. And then some other stuff that I, at least I've never seen before in D, which enables to, to, to create, again, uh, macromolecules, which then can themselves self-assemble into more complex structures. And finally, we have seen last time, and that enables to make a nice bridge as well with the very first um, few minutes of the first lecture, uh, which is that it can also create macroscopic assemblies of such colloids. And you see here a very nice picture of electronic microscope of colloids that are very, very well ordered in a very nice crystalline pattern. And as you probably imagine, yes, they are part of a colloidal crystal. So I think this is the perfect moment to end this set of lectures on the introduction to the physics of colloids. And in particular, because the timing seems nice, because we have started the lectures by talking how materials of today and of our everyday life is comprising colloidal particles in a suspension, okay, in a solvent, and how it affects all the properties of the uh, of these systems, um, and we have of course done a lot since we we, we stated this. But by working a lot on how these um, colloidal particles interact, we have ended up realizing that these colloidal particles will very likely be the building blocks of the materials of tomorrow. And I think this ends perfectly this um, set of introductory lectures. And of course, how these, these systems ought to be built is a subject for a different set of lectures, I'm afraid. And I will leave you here and maybe see you next time in another set of videos.